Lynn, I really appreciate being here with you today to talk about social protections to overcome vulnerable situations in families. Before we go too far, I just want to spend some time introducing myself. My name is Joe Grivach. I hold a doctoral degree in family science, and I completed postdoctoral training in the social ecology of health. I'm currently an associate dean of research and faculty at the, in the College of Health and Human Sciences at San Jose State University. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Now, in my world, everything comes down to sort of goals and specific aims because they, they kind of give us, give us a sense of what's our, our North Star, where are we going, but then they also help us understand how we're going to get there. And so, therefore, the overall goal of my time with you today is to illustrate how family science, its focus, its methods, and its results contribute to the creation of effective and sustainable social protection systems for families. Now, in order to achieve that, I've really got three primary aims. And the first one is that I want to describe family si what family science is and illustrate its relevance to designing and implementing effective social protection systems. Then I want to outline some of the primary drivers of vulnerability among families because we have to know what makes families vulnerable before we can come up with solutions to that. And then lastly, I hope to overcome some or overview some components of effective social protection systems and give some concrete strategies for advancing them. So with that, let's begin with talking about what family science is. And the National Council on Family Relations, which is the professional organization underlying family science as a unique discipline, officially defines family science as the scientific study of families in close interpersonal relationships. Now, as a legacy member and fellow of the National Council, Council on Family Relations, I endorse that definition. However, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out some obvious difficulties with it. And perhaps the most obvious difficulty with it is that the definition of family science is partly defined by the word family in the definition. So it creates some circularity there. Equally, the conjunction of families, quote unquote, with close interpersonal relationships, quote unquote, you know, kind of creates the idea that there's some overlap, but clearly family science does not prioritize research on lasting friendships, for example, nor does it focus on research on effective mentor-mentee relationships, which can have involved levels of trust and shared goals and mutual respect, but yet they're not the same kind of close interpersonal relationship. Rather, family science prioritizes this particular type of close interpersonal relationship, the kind that create and perpetuate a distinctive type of social group that's oftentimes called family, and it takes the form of marriage and commitment, committed partnerships and kinship connections such as those between parents and children and among sibling groups. So while it's not endorsed by anyone, I think a better definition of family science is something like this one. And it's totally my definition, so it's not the National Council on Family Relations endorsing it. But I think a better definition of family science is the discovery of principles and the application of those principles for strengthening interpersonal relationships in family social groups. Now, be that as it may, family science <clears throat> has several features that make it somewhat distinctive. And I want to spend just a few minutes talking about those points of distinction. And the first point of distinction is that family science is fundamentally relationship focused. Now, what relationship focused means is a little bit ambiguous. So let me see if I can make that a little bit more concrete. I'd like to unpack it a little bit. Now, this is the neighborhood that I grew up in. It's obviously a rural area. I grew up in this house right here from the time I was roughly seven years old until the time I got married and moved out at roughly 21 years of age. This was my home. This was my neighborhood. And as you can see, there were houses scattered across the landscape, but it was mostly a rural area. And in each of these houses, there was a somewhat different configuration of people living in those houses. 
So for example, in this farm immediately adjacent to where I grew up, it was a retired couple. Um, no longer did they have children in the household. It was just an elderly gentleman and his wife. And that elderly gentleman and his wife happened to be the individuals that my parents bought the land from in order to build the house that I grew up in. And in still some of these other houses that were up and down the street, there were some families or some married individuals that had children of various ages. In this farm right here where I grew up and made my living, you know, kind of my summer wages, it was a, a, a couple that was unable to bear children and so therefore they were, they were on their own and so they looked to the neighbors to help them pull in the crops, so to speak. My point behind all of this is that a relationship focus is not only interested in the relationships inside those homes, those quote unquote families, but they are also interested in the relationships among those families because it recognizes that relationships inside of families are not independent or do not occur in a vacuum that's separate from relationships outside of those families. So for example, I rode the bus and, and I got to know some of the children in those other families and we had play dates and things of the sort. And I acquired some habits from some of those playmates that my parents didn't like and I'm sure the same thing happened elsewhere. Or likewise, back in the day, we had a thing called a party line where I had to take my turn on the telephone waiting for the neighbors to get off so that I could call my friends. So there were relationships built between those households, those different families, but then those relationships were also shaped by a local economy that hired individuals and a local educational system that tended to educate all of us in a fairly similar fashion that was under government jurisdiction. And there was also a finite number of faith communities that we all belong to. All of that is entailed in the idea of a relationship focus. Because fundamentally, being relationship focused is viewing relationships in families within the context that those families live, breathe, and thrive, and do daily life. So family science is relationship focused. But in, in addition to that, like most sciences, family science is evidence-based. Just like other sciences, we are a science that uses observational data regarding what we can see, touch, taste, feel, and hear. But in addition to that, family science also recognizes the value of non-tangible features of practical and professional experience because they give us insight into family life. But then in addition to being evidence-based, family science is also prevention-focused. We believe that an ounce of prevention is more valuable than pounds of cure, remediation, or rehabilitations. Next, family science is strengths-oriented. As a discipline, we reject the idea that dysfunction or pathology in interpersonal relationships and families are not a reflection of deficits and weakness. Rather, every family is, is, is comprised of strengths that can be made stronger and of basic elements that can be grown and converted into strengths. Finally, family, family science is fundamentally translational in nature. Our bread and butter as scientists of discovery, scientists of practice or both, is fundamentally the creation of actionable tools that strengthen families. Oh, I see I had a blip there, sorry about that. So we're translational. So therefore, as we are gonna summarize things, family science is the scientific study of families and close interpersonal relationships to use the official NCFR definition. And we're distinctive because we're relationship focused. We focus on relationships among family members and between families within their larger social institutions or more simply, we focus on relationships and context. It is the calling card of our discipline. Our science, like most, is based on evidence, but we embrace different types of evidence, including the kinds of evidence that comes from personal and professional experience. Our science seeks to prevent problems before they occur, building upon the inherent strengths of every individual and relationship. And lastly, our science is applied or translational. 
We want to make families better and in turn make the world a better place. So with that, we can start thinking about how to design effective protection systems for families, but that first requires us to understand the very circumstances that create family vulnerability. How can we create protection systems if we don't know the basic mechanisms that make families vulnerable to begin with? And so therefore, over the course of the next few minutes, I'm gonna spend some time talking about drivers of family vulnerability. And of course, there's, there's a wide variety of them. They take different shapes and forms, but each of those shapes and forms can be reduced down to a finite number of categories, what I'm calling drivers of family vulnerability. And the first driver or the first force that, that creates family vulnerability is fundamentally based in the economy. If the world learned nothing from the meltdown of 2008, um, when the global economy nearly collapsed, is that every individual and family across the socioeconomic spectrum was affected by the larger economy. Likewise, here in the United States, in the ongoing recession that we're experiencing worldwide, it tells us, makes it very clear that when the economy is difficult, it makes it very hard for families to secure, secure basic, basic necessities, necessities like, like shelter and food. But in addition to that, families' ability to secure those basic necessities are ultimately and intimately connected to one or more family members' ability to earn and uh, earn wages or salary, or in other words, to be employed. And regardless of whether unemployment is driven by broader economic forces like recession, or a local financial decision, such as a factory or, or an employer shutting their doors, leaving lots of individuals without work, lost wages and earnings is a primary driver of family vulnerability. A second driver of family vulnerability could be summarized in the term of, of disasters. And of course, in an era of climate change, there's all sorts of discussion about natural disasters like wildfires that have devastated Hawaii recently, or Canada is currently battling over 300 wildfires across its nation. And likewise, Greece has been experiencing periods of evacuation because of wildfires. Other disasters like tropical cyclones and floodings and earthquakes, they're devastating because they damage substantial amounts of property, including homes and including places of business where people oftentimes need to earn a living to pay for their homes and to pay for their businesses. And so therefore, disasters create family vulnerability by both destroying personal property and impeding the ability to work. And ultimately, they also have the possibility of the untimely loss of life. So all of these create points of vulnerability and are tied in to the next category of drivers of vulnerability, and that is emergency health events. Now, sometimes disasters like those we just talked about produce um, a, a, a serious injury. They produce substantial acute events, but health events also happen, whether they're from accidental injury or from aspects of aging or whether it's a manifestation of some kind of a genetic disorder. Health events are drivers of family vulnerability. The unexpected death or disablement of a wage earner cuts the ability for a family to earn wages and to subsequently pay for housing and, and food. The cost of care for chronic conditions and other forms of long-term care can either rapidly deplete long, uh, accumulated savings or the sheer cost of them, especially in today's specialized healthcare delivery system, is oftentimes out of reach for many individuals, even if they have jobs. Next, depending on the level of disability, children with special needs or individuals with long-term care can force other members of families to withdraw from the labor force so that they can provide the kind of care that may, perhaps they cannot receive through specialized systems. So health and health-related events are a driver of family vulnerability. And then likewise, psychological and behavioral difficulties can also create family vulnerability. The behavioral consequences of neurobehavioral neuro conditions like autism or Alzheimer's disease 
frequently require constant vigilance, leaving families exhausted and perhaps needing to exit the labor force. Stigma attached to alcoholism or children with behavioral disorders or depression and other forms of, of psychological disorder can leave families isolated and without social systems. Things like domestic violence and child abuse and neglect or simply apathy can create health problems, can result in lost wages, and can leave individuals isolated and without hope and purpose. And in addition to that, then, we have different forms of manufactured forms of family vulnerability. Deliberate migration and displacement can create family vulnerability. I've studied immigrants for over 20 years of my career, and I know that the vast majority of immigrants move themselves and their families for the hope of securing wages and securing the financial wherewithal to be able to support their families and achieve their responsibilities to society. Yet those very same immigrants you know, do a, a cost-benefit analysis recognizing that they're actually placing their families in points of vulnerability if they decide to leave families behind and migrate individually. But then displacements because of disaster or war or economic downturn can also create points of vulnerability because it can leave families without food, it can leave families without shelter. And then lastly, conflict and social upheaval also produces family vulnerability because of disruptions to employment, potential losses of home and potential losses of, of opportunities to work because streets are being rioted, businesses are being shut down, and then lastly, there's also the very clear opportunity both in social disruption due to um, uh, incivility, but then also to war, is the actual harm or death of family members. So in summary, the primary drivers of family vulnerability are external and internal to families. External drivers are the local and regional economy circumstances related to natural disaster and the possibility of manufactured disaster from social instability, inequality, and social strife. But vulnerability also comes from inside families, where, may, where family members can be made susceptible to unemployment, perhaps because of, in, of, of insufficient training or a, a, a restricted local uh, job economy but they can also be rendered vulnerable from housing insecurity, from older poor housing opportunities, as well as from different aspects of physical and mental well-being. So it's those internal and external drivers of family vulnerability that are directly linked to specific social protection systems that we're gonna talk about next. And the very first social protection system that's fundamental to an effective social protection system is the availability of basic food and housing assistance. Of course, food and housing are basic requirements for survival. The absence or the minimization of quality food, the, in, uh, the, the availability of housing or crowded or, under or, or, or insufficient housing impedes basic functioning, promotes disease, and it ultimately impedes a, an, an individual's ability to participate in society. But on top of that, food and housing programs are effective because they reduce poverty by lightening the financial burden of securing those basic needs. I live in the Silicon Valley where the average cost of a home is over a million dollars, but yet the average household income is $55,000 per year. There is no way for a typical family or household to be able to get a home off of $55,000 a year when the average cost is $1.2 million. This is a concrete example of how housing and food programs can lighten the load to help secure stable, sufficient housing to help families thrive. Now features of strong programs uh, you know, like nutrition and housing is that they have to be accessible. They have to be able to be uh, accessed by the individuals who need them and they need to be able to create an access point or an entree point into available food and housing um, uh, uh, systems. But in addition to that, they need to be sufficiently flexible and prioritize 
healthful housing and healthful food options that are appropriate for the targeted group. Healthy food, for example, in the Midwest of the United States is undoubtedly very different than healthy food in, in Vietnam or healthy food in parts of Africa. So therefore, there needs to be opportunity to prioritize locally appropriate balanced diet to be able to meet the needs of individuals and families. A next feature of, of effective social systems, social um, uh, protection systems, is cash transfers. And as implied by the title, a cash transfer is simply the movement of a liquid resource to individuals who are affected and families who are affected. Cash, cash transfers take two general forms. The first is non-conditional cash transfers, where there's essentially the movement of money from one entity to another, usually individuals and families, and they're most effective in times of crisis because there's no strings attached to them, hence the, ta the, the label um, uh, uh, cash transfers that are non-conditional. But then there's other forms called conditional cash transfers where the title implies there's conditions that go along with those, with those resources. Conditions on how the money is applied and who's eligible and how eligibility is sustained based on uh, specific behaviors and behavior patterns of the individuals who are receiving them. Now critical characteristics of effective conditional cash transfer programs are precise targeting and eligibility criterion. They need to be precise because people need to know, do I qualify? And they need to be able to be executed and implemented in a fair and equitable way. That's why precise targeting and eligibility criterion are so important. Likewise, regular and predictable payment schedules are essential to success and likewise sufficient, although not luxurious, benefit is also needed. And then lastly, there needs to be transparency and a robust men, uh, monitoring and evaluation system to ensure that those, those cash transfer systems are working effectively. Another essential feature of effective social protection systems is protections against unemployment, or what's sometimes referred to as comprehensive unemployment insurance. As I've already pointed out several times, working for wages or salary is how the vast majority of families acquire the financial resources to secure basic needs like shelter and food. So therefore, successful unemployment programs are oftentimes characterized by making sure that everyone, regardless of who you are in the labor force, has access to an unemployment protection system. That that unemployment protection system is flexible. The growth of the gig economy in many parts of the, of the industrial world, things like Uber drivers, things like uh, delivery services for, thing, for food and that sort of thing, those are all examples of the gig economy that for periods of time, especially early and in some parts of the world, current places, those individuals are not eligible for unemployment systems because they were sort of under the radar of official employment systems. But other elements of successful um, unemployment programs are things like timely and predictable payment so that people can make rent when rent is due or the housing payment. But then also unemployment systems are, bet are, are work best when there's wraparound systems like job training, uh, assistance with job searches, and flexibility um, and integrations with social services. You know, ultimately, unemployment compensation uh, programs or unemployment systems like these work because they minimize the spiral into poverty during periods of unemployment, thereby protecting families. Another system of, of, of social protection systems is essentially benefit programs for specific people groups like the elderly, young children, and individuals with disability. And the primary practical reason for these benefit programs are these individuals, especially children, are unable to secure their own wages or salary. And so therefore, the cash benefit systems provide a way of securing basic needs like shelter, healthcare, and food. 
But more abstractly, benefit programs are also meaningful because they provide cash benefits and a form of equity to all individuals despite their ability to work or to contribute um, in terms of modes of production in a production-focused economy. Now, critical features of, of benefit programs like these is, again, they need to be unbiased um, if they're going to be targeted or they need to be universal to see to it that they do not perpetuate biases in some way, shape, or form. The programs need to be easily accessible for both applying and receiving the benefit. The benefits need to be timely and, occur, and again occur in a predictable fashion. And where it's necessary, like with child benefit programs, there needs to be very clear expectations for how those benefits will be used. And so in the case of many child benefit programs, there's oftentimes expectations that children will be immunized to help sustain their health and well-being. Children will receive typical anticipatory guidance and care from a healthcare professional so that children stay healthy and ultimately make their way into being thriving and uh, ability, uh, having a thriving ability to produce in society. Now finally, the last feature of, of uh, social protection systems is universal health care. Now there's clearly no perfect system that's been defined, but nevertheless, populations that have universal health care generally have better health outcomes than populations that lack universal health care. And so the idea about that is, is that it, it, it enables better outcomes because it reduces the financial burden for end users, that is those individuals who are accessing care. And doing so it creates more equitable access to care because, and it, and it also minimizes disparities because receiving care is not dependent on the ability to pay for that care. It also enables earlier intervention, so if you don't have an out-of-pocket cost to, to, to have that sniffle or that ache and pain sort of checked out, it maybe allows us to capture uh, conditions before they turn into whole-scale problems that require more costly remediations and treatments to be able to end them. But then they also facilitate more integrated care, including prevention, chronic disease management, and mental health services. And ultimately, as I've already said, universal health care is critical because it distances the ability to pay for health care from the receipt of essential services. So those are the fundamental targets or forms that universal health, excuse me, universal social protection systems take. And that leads us to a fundamental question, and that is, what does family science have to say about building effective social protection systems. And it'll come as no surprise to you that I think that it has that family science has a ton to say about it. I am biased, but it begins with the essential feature of our disciplinary identity of being translational. Our science is designed to fundamentally strengthen families while other disciplines seek to understand families, so for example, family psychologists prioritize academic understanding so that eventually that understanding can be made, make its way into clinical problems and, and, and therapeutic encounters, or family sociologists seek to understand the role of families and the sustainability and change of social systems. But the thing that makes family science unique and valuable is its distinct focus on translation. And family science focuses on prevention is entirely consistent with the core principles of designing and sustaining social protection systems. The best scenario is a world where families are free of impediments attributed to poverty, inequality, and social discord because they eliminate because they eliminate facilities and the outcome and the outcome is ultimately economic stability, growth, quality of life, and social cohesion. And the family science literature is replete with studies on these topics, and virtually every family program targets these valued outcomes. But yet there's more. Family science's features and focus also guide building effective social protection systems. Let's face the facts. 
social protection systems, at least in the United States and perhaps around the world, are highly politicized. And part of that politicized debate revolves around ideology. The dominant model for social protection systems is that of government, but yet members of politically conservative groups think that government should be limited at both the federal, regional, and maybe even the state levels. Another part of the politicization of, of social protection systems is fiscal constraints. Some people believe that fiscal resources are finite and best managed locally, whereas others believe that the, the, the best way to ensure equality is to centralize those fiscal resources. But importantly, there's also concerns around basic ideas of self-reliance and autonomy and personal responsibility. And this last issue is particularly pernicious because it creates stereotypes of dependency that perpetuate myths around the lavish lifestyle of quote unquote welfare queens or they result in the, the, in the stigmatization that's oftentimes connected with recipients of social protections and social problems like, so, like substance use and criminality. But our discipline's relationship focused approach offers tools to overcome some of this, 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 this politicking because it creates effective social protect, because the creation of effective social protection systems requires strong and sustained relationships. So a family scientist would advance social protection systems by prioritizing relationships. It would involve inviting different stakeholders to the table to talk about the issues that are at play. So rather than socially minded people only talking to other socially minded individuals or conservatively minded people only talking to other conservatively minded people, we invite all stakeholders to the table so that all voices can be heard, including those marginalized voices of the end users themselves, so that we can identify common goals. Likewise, the relationship focus feature of family scientists recognizes that the world is a complex place. There are exceedingly excessive costs and sometimes there are bureaucratic systems that undoubtedly can be made more efficient, perhaps through other models that are not governmental. But then we also need to recognize that the few that, that sometimes the few people who may make up the outlier stories that, that perpetuate myths like the welfare queen, that there is some truth to those and we need to be willing to acknowledge some of those truths and find better ways to winnow out those people who are taking advantage of it. So ultimately being relationship focused is valuable because it is the glue that facilitates change and the actual creation of effective social protection systems. But in addition to that, the accumulated family science uh, body of literature is also useful for reinforcing the evidence-based need to make sure that social protection systems are in fact evidence-based. I serve as the deputy editor for one of our primary journals and I can tell you there is substantial variety and stat substantial depth in the kind of evidence that's, that can be brought to bear to not only demonstrate whether or not a social protection system works, but also to highlight points of weakness in those social protection systems. At the end of the day, a social system is that, a system. If you monkey around in one part of the system, there is the very strong likelihood of unanticipated consequences. So for example, in early days of, of, of United States welfare reform, very stringent systems were put into place for some of the child benefit uh, 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 programs that were put into place, including things like if you didn't have enough hours on your job, you could lose your child benefit for child care. Well, we've learned through time that oftentimes those entry level jobs are precarious. They may not have a set work schedule. There may not be the ability to get 35 or 40 hours a week and women lost their child benefit for to support their their child care privileges 
because their jobs were unstable. We learned that through research that identified unanticipated consequences of the very structure of the social protection system that we created. And so therefore, we now have strong evidence that points us to places where sometimes there's mistakes in our design and we can make them better. And so resource allocation studies and comparative research designs are all valuable to see to it that we make our social protection systems robust, that they're constantly subject to scrutiny to see to it that we're making them better and we're keeping the best and we're, and we're, and we're, and we're refining weaknesses where they exist. But then we also ultimately recognize that research is always imperfect. And so therefore they can only guide decisions, they cannot dictate decisions. And then finally, we have to recognize that ultimately, social protection systems rest on a set of assumptions. Social protection systems rest on the assumption that individuals have the capacity to be self-sufficient. They rest on the assumption that, person, that individuals want to be responsible for themselves, for their children, and for their family's well-being if given the opportunity, they would be responsible for those individuals. We also have to recognize that, that, that social um, protection systems assume that people are willing to take personal accountability and that every individual has something greater to, excuse me, something to give to the greater good because every individual has value. And this is completely aligned with family science's notion of let's leverage strength. Social protection systems basic assumptions are not strong. We don't have to take them on a leap of faith. All of these assumptions are built into the fundamental DNA of what it means to be human. And so therefore, if we build upon those strengths of those human qualities, it's not hard to imagine that they can work and produce valuable ends because they are not strong assumptions. At best, they're weak assumptions. We've got decades, millennia of philosophy and scientific evidence that tells us that people do have capacity for self-sufficiency. Perhaps not everyone, like my daughter, who will never be self-sufficient, but most have capacity for self-sufficiency. Most desire a responsibility to care for themselves and their families. Most people embrace accountability and follow rules when they're given them. And then every person has something valuable to contribute. So what does family science have to say about advancing social protection systems? Well, I'd say a lot. Our relationships focused orientation and our, and our desire to really focus on the glue that holds individual families and families and neighborhoods together and neighborhoods in their communities and so on, that relationship glue is fundamental to the creation of strong social protections. We have an evidence base that's deep and long and historical that helps us build and evaluate strong and effective social protection systems. We're prevention oriented so that we avoid problems before they start so that we can achieve larger goods like quality of life and economic growth and the opportunity for social cohesion. And we do that by building on basic inherent strengths that we know are part of the basic human DNA. And then lastly, family science is translational. And so therefore, an effective and appropriate tool for advancing social protections to overcome situations in the family. I look forward to your questions and I look forward to working with you in advancing these solutions. Thanks for your time.